Hi, welcome to this lecture on uh, software development methodologies. So in this lecture, we're going to look at the various methods or the various uh, models that are used in this process of developing a software. So, so far, we have learned that there's the software development life cycle, and this life cycle has got certain phases. So in this life cycle, we start with the planning phase, and then <clears throat> under the planning phase, we've got the project initiation, uh, the feasibility studies and then we do the project management scheduling time um, timelines milestones coming up with our teams and the like then we get to the analysis stage where we we, we now uh, do requirements gathering requirements analysis and then we do our data modeling as well as this is where probably most of the time we're going to use our models as well then we also get into the design stage where we come up with the architectures of the system the specifications and then under implementation we then fully develop and we've, we deploy the system we test we test the system we deploy it and then we start to maintain it <clears throat> so you will find that um in this life cycle all the all systems will go through this life cycle okay but as they go through this life cycle they've got certain methods or ways that they go through this life cycle Okay, so those methods will now differ and those are the kind of methods that we want to look for in this lecture. Now the factors that affect which methodology is used as you create a system using the software development lifecycle include the finances that are available, how much money do you have, um, how much time do you have to develop the system, is this something that needs to be deployed immediately or is it something that you can take another six months to one year uh, developing. Then there's the issue of how much resources in terms of compute do you actually have? Do you have a lot of memory, a lot of uh, CPU, a lot of uh, storage? Then it's also about the staff, who is available and at what time? And where are they based? So all these constraints now influence the type of methodology that you're going to use as you develop your system using the software development lifecycle. So what is a software development methodology? So basically a methodology is a, is a set of steps that you use or a set of steps a set of guidelines or certain activities that you do as you try to solve a certain problem so in the context of softwares a software development methodology would be a set of steps that you use or that you follow or certain guidelines that you use as you develop a software so all these methodologies are governed by the software development life cycle okay so there are so many different types of methodologies that have been develop, developed out there but you'll find that most of them are just minor variations of each other so in this uh, course we're going to cover five main uh, development methodologies we're going to cover code and fix as well as um, the commercial of the shelf system now these are very minor ones so we're just going to cover them for you to understand them but the three main ones that you would want to cover are the water format uh, model the agile methods as well as the spiral methodology so those are the three that we really want to cover so you'll find that under the software development uh, life cycle we have these four main stages planning analysis design and implementation but these four main stages can be broken down into many more stages for example in this uh, slide you can see there's the project identification and selection as well as project initiation and planning now those under the main mode the main four steps would be under planning then there's the analysis which can stand on its own then there's the design which stands on its own as well then implementation and maintenance can all fall under implementation so you can be required to produce the shorter version of the system development life cycle which only shows the four stages or you can be asked to produce um, the broken down stages of the software development life cycle where now you have to show all the other um, four stages so that uh, all the other three stages to make sure that there are seven stages but the key thing now when it comes to methodologies is how do we traverse from one stage to another do we do it in a sequential manner do we do it in a round robin manner do we actually loop from one stage to another? Can we jump from design straight back to project identification? Can we move from implementation back to analysis? You know, those are the kind of methodologies now that we are going to look at to say, how do you get it done? So we've already looked at the phases of the systems development life cycle that we have got our planning, so project initiation and um, pro project management. Then we've got analysis where we study our requirements 
and make sure that we can come up with a system proposal there. Then we come to the design stage where we come up with the architectures, both the logical design of how the system actually functions from a logical perspective, how data flows, as well as from the physical design, the technical specifications of the actual hardware and software that you're going to use for the system. Then we get to implementation where you test your system, then you deploy it, and then you maintain it as well as train users. So we're not going to dwell on that, but we're going to delve straight into the methodologies. So what is a life cycle model? A life cycle model basically is the same as a methodology. It is basically a description of the sequence of activities carried out <coughs> in a software engineering project <coughs> in relative of order of these activities. So the order of these activities now is what we are going to, to be the uh, methodologies that we look at. The methodologies will differ in how they traverse those various stages of the software development life cycle. And we're going to see that very soon. So there are so many types of um, um, methodologies that have been developed, as I said before. There's the, these are some of them that are listed. But the key ones that we really want to look at are basically the waterfall model, the agile methods, which include rapid prototyping and unified process. There's the commercial of the shelf systems. And then there's also the spiral model. So those are the ones that we really want to look at because they are key. So just keep in mind that you want to look at the waterfall model, the agile methods, as well as uh, the spiral methods. Those are the three main ones. Okay. So what is the benefit of actually using um, a software development lifecycle before we actually delve into them? What is the benefit? So the benefit of using a life cycle is that it can increase the development speed because the moment you actually follow those steps and make sure that you are doing the right thing at the right time once and for all, you can actually quickly deploy your system and get it to market fast. It also improves product quality because they are, all these methods have got certain controls that they have to make sure that the quality of the product is enforced and we can actually... <clears throat> determine it and make sure that the customer gets the best product. There's also project visibility. So the project planning side of things allows us to really see what, what is happening. We can also see the documents that are being produced. We can see the actual milestones that are being achieved. So there's project visibility and everybody can see the progress that's actually happening. Then it also manages the administrative overhead where it allows um, the project manager or the systems analyst to be able to manage the project because there are certain clear clearly stated steps or activities that have to be done at a certain time and there are certain people that are actually required at a specific time. So it makes it easy for the project managers to really know who is doing what and what is being done by who and at what, not, at what time. Then it also helps in uh, managing the risk exposure of the project because when you, can, when you can see what is happening at each stage, be it at planning, be it at analysis, as you go through those stages, you can actually see the risks that are happening. And then you come up with controls that allow you to then manage those risks so that they do not affect the whole project. So you can actually uh, note risks uh, in time before they actually disrupt the whole project. Then it also improves with communication, with customer relations, and generally getting the business to feel the value that they are getting from the project as it is uh, being developed. So now <clears throat> let's, start, let's delve into these projects. So the first one we just want to look at is the code and fix. The code and fix is, as the name says, a method where you just <clears throat> start programming the, the, the software and then as you continue, go on programming, you fix any problems that you face. So with code and fix, you don't really have any plan. All you do is just, you just sit down, you get your laptop, you open your software development tools, and then you just program. Now with code and fix, <clears throat> there isn't any, there ain't, and many tools that you're going to be using there or I mean there ain't many uh, methods or activities that you're going to be doing there the key thing is you're just sitting down and, co and programming and then if you fi face any challenge you then just fix it there and then now the advantages of this is that it's really simple to manage because I mean it's a person who is just programming as they go you know so there really isn't any back and forth that is happening there you actually see the progress uh, quite early in the system since somebody's just programming it you can actually see the stages quite early to see oh this person has already done this and you because you don't have all these administrative overheads you can quickly come here a software running also it does not require a lot of expertise so anyone can do it i mean even if you have never really learned systems analysis and design all you just need is to know a certain programming language and then you start programming and fix things as you go 
then it, this kind of uh, code and fix is very good for very small uh, systems or for proof of concepts projects so a proof of concept project is a project where you just want to prove to someone or to show someone how something works so with a proof of concept all you're trying to do is to make sure that the other party understands what you're saying or what you're trying to do so at times it may not be actually developing the the full flesh system but you're just coming up with something small enough to allow people to just understand what you're talking about or how things are going to flow so those are the some of the advantages of the code code and fix uh, methodology however it also has its uh, disadvantages the problem is that it has no visibility you no one really knows what you're programming no one really knows what you're doing it also has no resource planning since you're just programming as you go you don't know what you need when and how so at times you may be programming for for this week doing something and the next week you then realize oh i want this but that thing is not available now you may need either to first wait for it to be available or you may now need to jump stages or make shortcuts and then you end up messing up the project and as you fix and go you're actually fixing things that are actually wrong and you continue producing more and more wrong things it also has the challenge of no deadlines because since we don't have a plan we can't really tell a person what we really expect you know so a person can just program and say you know what i'm facing these challenges i will fix them i will do whatever i have uh, um i can at, given the time i have so the person can actually work at their own time and which can result in delays uh, in the delivery of the software then if a person makes <clears throat> makes a mistake it may be very hard to detect or correct that mistake so since they're just programming if they've got 1000 lines of code now or they've got different functions and modules which are not organized then they face the challenge of actually not being able to detect or understand where the problem is arising in their software so code and fix is makes it difficult to trace errors as well as to customize the software in future you know so it's not really used for big projects as we said before it's good for proof of, proof of concepts or for very small ad hoc projects that you just want to do um, in your own time <clears throat> so basically that's all about code and fix the next um, one we want to look at is the commercial of the shelf uh, systems so the commercial of the shelf uh, software is basically a method where we just take software of which has already been developed by other people or by other companies and then we tweak it or we customize it to suit our environment this applies usually if you look at um, enterprise resource planning systems our ERPs our SAP where the system already comes with all its modules developed and all we now have to do is to integrate it with our other systems as well as make a few modifications to it so that it suits our needs so with commercial with the commercial of the shelf uh, software method all you're doing is taking something that has already been developed and uh, customizing as well as integrating it with other systems so this one has got the advantages of allowing us to quickly develop a system and it's also a cheap solution it also allows us to have a well-developed system um, since we believe the company would have taken all the care to come up with a standard and robust system <clears throat> it also gives usually these systems they give you all the basic functionalities that allow you to uh, run a company well or to, to do whatever it is that you want to do and as far as project management is concerned these systems are easy to manage because you already know what functions they have so as far as customization and integration is concerned you already have um, an idea of who you are going to talk to and <clears throat> when they are supposed to do something however the challenges that we have with commercial of the shelf systems now is that at times you may not get the full functionality that you, you expect or the full customization that you expect from the system so you're going to have limited functionality because you do not have the power to actually uh, go into the code of that system or into the nitty-gritties of that system and customize it to the exact needs of of your business so you are limited by what it can do and by as far as uh, it can be customized or integrated with other systems then it also comes the challenges with uh, licensing now with licensing you can have challenges to do with maybe you your, the licensing costs are high or the licensing model does not allow you to accommodate either the number of departments or the number of people that you want to use that system so it may limit the number of people you want or the number of um, deployments integrations as well as users that can come to the system it also have challenges with um, uh, you know the problem with freeway or shareway is that due to the standardization of how they are developed they can actually make it quite difficult to protect against attacks or it can make it difficult as well when it comes to 
integration. So those are some of the challenges that come, including compatibility problems. Some of these standard softwares are not compatible with some of the ch with the softwares that you'll be using in your in your business. So when it comes to integrating those systems so that they can share data, it becomes quite difficult or impossible as, as a result, making the whole project uh, not successful. So that's commercial off the shelf system. So, so far we've looked at code and fix. We have looked at commercial off the shelf system. Now those are very basic um, development methodologies that everybody can use. Now we want to move into the big three and we'll start off with the waterfall model. So the waterfall model is a classic life cycle model. It is widely known everywhere. Everybody understands it and everybody can use it. So how does it work? Basically with the waterfall model, you move from one step to the other. So what you do is the moment you move from the, for example, from the use, you move from user requirements to software requirements, you cannot go back to user requirements. So it's basically like um, a waterfall. Let's look at uh, Victoria Falls. When water flows from the top of Victoria Falls to the bottom of Victoria Falls, it can never go up again. So that's the model that's being developed, that's being used here under the waterfall model. The waterfall model is basically saying, if you complete one stage and move to a next to the next stage, then you cannot go back to the to that last stage. So the moment you complete a stage, that's it. You have closed it off and you move on with your project. Okay. So you cannot go back and say, you know what, um, we have finished user requirements. Now we are doing software requirements. And then you realize there's something that you need, you uh, you want to go back to user requirements again. With the waterfall model, you can't do that. Once you finish user requirements, you move to software requirements. Once you finish software requirements, you move to architecture design, and that's how it works. Now, these steps, the user requirements, software requirements, architecture design, etc., that are in this slide, are more of a guideline of the steps that you are going to take. But these steps may the, these steps may differ depending on the project. But what we know is they will all be under the software development lifecycle of planning, analysis, design, and implementation. So whatever you're going to choose or the kind of steps that you're going to take, they will still be governed by the overall software development life cycle. So just remember that under the waterfall model, the important thing to remember is that the moment you complete one stage, you cannot go back to it in the event that there's something else that you want to do. So if you close a, pro a stage and move to the next stage, you cannot go back to that stage. Just like water flow, um, flowing down on a waterfall, it cannot go back again. So what are the advantages of having a system like this? First, it is very easy to understand and implement. I mean, if you lay out all your steps that you're going to follow, if you, you, all you have to do is just move from one step to another without having to, uh, to be just looping around all those steps. So once you complete a step, you move to the next one, simply simple as that, and then you move to the next one until you're done with your project. It's also widely used and known, but it's, well, we can say it's known in theory because a lot of people may end up tweaking it to suit their needs. We shall see with the other development methodologies that we're going to do. But in its strictest sense, it's very easy to use and um, a lot of people can actually use it and get software done. It's also good for enforcing good habits. So what it does is it allows or it makes the analysts as well as the system developers make sure that they do the best work at each stage. So they are not just people who are just trying things out, but they make sure that at whatever stage we are, if for example, we're at the architecture design stage, we make sure that <clears throat> we complete that stage in full and thoroughly, and we make sure that we have what our quality assurance done so that by the time we move to the next step, we are sure that we have done the right thing and there's no need for us to go back there. Then it also allows us to identify our deliverables and milestones. So because we, we cannot go back to the each stage, we need to make sure that Whenever we get to a stage and when we complete it, we know exactly what is expected of that stage. And when we are now evaluating whether we have actually accomplished those things before we move into the next stage, we, can, we actually know what to expect as an output of that stage. It's also document driven, so everything has to be documented so that it's clear to everybody, so that you don't you avoid making um, mistakes. Then it's good to use on mature products, products that have been developed before, products that just need minor tweaking or minor changes, as well as on weak teams. Now, weak teams may not really know what to do, so they need a system that is well-defined and that is clear for them to deliver exactly what is expected of them. But what are some of the challenges that we can face on using the software, using the waterfall model? <clears throat> So the waterfall model is a bit not realistic, you know. It's really difficult for you to say, I have completed this stage 
and I have done everything expected of it and I don't need to do it again. So it's a bit idealistic in that sense and it makes it difficult to really come up with um, the system that you want in the event that you face certain risks, in the event that certain things change. So you, it makes it difficult for you to then go back and make all those changes. It does not actually show the iterative nature of um, exploratory de development. This means that it does not show that when you are actually developing a system and you are trying to find the best way of putting across a certain idea or implementing a certain solution, there is need for you to iterate between the users and the system and the developers and to continue tweaking and changing the various things that affect the development of that system. So with the waterfall model now, that, that does not exist. You are not allowed to actually go back to your next stage. So you cannot have that iterative nature which allows you to come up with different ideas and designs as you develop your system. It's also it's also very unrealistic for you to expect to have accurate requirements from the start. I mean, people don't know what they want at times, you know. So the, what they give you at the start is usually best to, to be taken as a guideline rather than the definitive um, requirements. So most people will only realize later on to say, oh, no, we gave you this requirement, but what we actually expect is this and that. So they actually change requirements as they go on. So to use the waterfall model now, it will not allow you to accommodate those changes and hence you develop a useless system. And also it allows, um, it makes it difficult now to fix errors because you can find them later on when the system has already been developed or at a later stage when you cannot go back. Um, it makes it difficult to manage risk in this system because risk management becomes a challenge since you cannot go back to other steps to fix risks or challenges that you foresee or that you are currently seeing. Then, um, as I said, it makes it difficult to make changes. It has got significant administrative overhead because each stage has to be managed thoroughly and even if after managing it thoroughly, you're not st you're still not sure whether you've actually done um, the, right, the right work. So basically, that's the waterfall model. So the waterfall model is a model where once you complete one stage or once you complete a stage and move to another, you cannot go back to the previous stage. So you only fall down to the next stage. You are not allowed to go back up again to the next stage. Now, let's move to agile system development. So under Agile system development, you find that there are certain principles that um, follow the Agile software development methodologies. So there's not one Agile software development methodology. There are many Agile development methodologies. But the key thing to remember is that all these Agile methodologies have got certain, um, have got certain core principles or core similarities that fall across all of them. So all of them have minor variations of each other and they follow a certain um, path or model that they all look um, like. So you'll find that the main principles of these um, agile principle of these agile methodologies are there's continuous de delivery of software, there's continuous collaboration with customer, there's continuous update according to changes, value participation, and simplicity in code as well as satisfying the specifications. Now, what this is all saying is that under agile principles, there is a lot of um, involvement of both the user and the development as well as a lot of collaboration and communication as the system is developed. Unlike the waterfall model where you move one step where you are only going down, with agile principles, with agile methodologies, you can actually loop around all those different stages. So if you are doing software, um, if you are doing maybe requirements gathering and then you realize, that, and then when you are not doing requirements analysis and you realize that certain requirements you have not been gathered, you are free to go back to those um, to, to the requirements gathering stage and gather all those requirements and then come back to requirements analysis again. So there's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of looping back. So it, the agile uh, method, methodologies have got an, an iterative nature. So they are, allow you to iterate or to loop around all the stages and fix any issues that you face. So you'll find that the agile methods allow you to develop systems faster and they allow you to fix issues faster and they also have um, good risk management. So we're just going to look at a few of these agile methods. So we're mainly going to look at the <clears throat> rapid application development system. Like I said, all these systems, have, all these um, agile development methodologies follow the same pattern. Basically, they have minor, they have minor variations of each other. So we're just going to look at the rapid application development um, method. 
and then <clears throat> as well as the the joint application development method before we move on to the spiral method so under the rapid application development methodology the idea is we just want to develop our software faster that's all we want to do so it's rapid in the sense that we are developing our system very fast so that we can quickly deploy it or get it to market so you'll find that under this RAD application development, you have many approaches, but the key thing is that you want the system to be developed in the shortest time possible and you have the highest quality that is also uh, possible. So with rapid application development, you find that you use techniques that, inv that involve uh, prototyping as well as joint application development. So we'll look at prototyping and see how it's actually used when developing systems fast as well as the joint application development techniques and see how they help in the development of systems. So when we talk of rapid application development, what exactly are we talking about? We are talking about a system, we are talking about a methodology that follows, uh, that tries to develop systems very fast. It doesn't have many formal stages. What it has is basically knowing that we need to get requirements from our users and then you turn those requirements, you analyze them a little bit, you develop a system or a prototype, you take that prototype back to the user, the user checks and says, oh, this is good, this is not good, and then you con you fix those issues, you take it back. So you continue iterating and improving the system as you go until the user is satisfied and then you can actually deploy or start selling that system. So you find that it requires fewer personnel because there's not a lot of project management going on. So you have fewer people uh, involved in the development of the system and it requires more direct uh, relationship between the developers and the users. So the user and the developers have to be in constant communication to allow the developer to develop the exact specifications of the user in the shortest time possible. Then uh, it also allows programs to be developed in a short time and it's suitable for very small projects. So you find that with Water for Model, it's key for big projects so that you don't waste a lot of time just looping around. So with the Water for Model, big projects are good because it allows you to have as many of the things done once and for all so that you don't waste too much time going back and forth. But with small projects now, you can actually use the agile development methodologies, especially the rapid application development methodology, where you can iterate as many times as possible and you are guaranteed that it, you will quickly finish the project because it's not very big. And you'll find that with rapid application development methodologies, you operate on a very low budget, okay? So you're not going to have a lot of money, you don't have a lot of people, you don't need a lot of uh, interactions, a lot of meetings, a lot of back and forth. You know, you can actually do it in a short, on a very low budget and in a very short space of time. So as I said before, the rapid application development has got very few stages or phases. You've got your requ requirements planning. So you get your requirements from a user from maybe you just have a meeting. Once you have those meetings, then you start designing the software. So this designing of the software is involves the development as well as the continuous con uh, uh, consultation with the users or the owners of the system so that you make sure that as you develop, you're developing exactly what they want. And then there's implementation. So you'll find that under RAD, so rapid application development, he has got many types of develop, uh, so methodologies that fall under it. So the rapid application development methodology is more like an umbrella uh, development methodology for other smaller development methodologies. So just remember that under rapid application development, we want fast delivery of software with very few stages and at a low budget. And then there are many diff different uh, variations that have been developed by different people under that key rapid application development methodology. Now, one of those uh, development methodologies that we'd want to look at is the joint application development. So joint application development is also another flavor of, um, of rapid application development. And the key thing in joint application development is that you have the users and the development and the developers as well as the analysts in one room working together to get the, so the software developed and deployed. So joint application development is where the analysis and design techniques are complemented by emphasizing participative development among system owners, users, designers, and builders. So the key thing is there is participative development. There's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of communication. And there's a lot of um, joint teamwork by the various people at the same time to develop the system. So you'll find that all the system designers as well as the users and the and the builders will come together 
and then they will start working on the software and they will stick together until they have fully developed it. So you can go through the notes in these slides, you can pause and read what is written here. But the key thing to remember is that under joint application development, we are basically taking everybody putting them in one space so it could be a physical space or a virtual space and then getting them to collaborate continuously and make sure that they can what they understand each other and they develop the system the system um, as fast as possible so with joint uh, application development it allows you to get the requirements quickly whilst at the same time turning them into actual uh, system development so Joint application development is a flavor of rapid application development and you'll find that all these other software methodologies that are listed here, for example, uh, rapid prototyping, universe, unified process, uh, agile methods, extreme programming, these are all variations of rapid application development and they fall under agile methodologies. So if it's a hierarchy, we would say we've got agile methodologies. Under agile methodologies, we have rapid application development methodologies and these are some of those um, various flavors of rapid application development methodologies. So just make sure you know your rapid application development methodologies as well as your joint application development methodologies. Now before we move to spiral method, we just want to look at um, prototyping and then and understand what prototyping it is is and how it affects the development of uh, software so prototyping basically is where you quickly develop a system with as minimum functionality as possible as well as it's meeting as few of the requirements as possible just to demonstrate how the system functions and how it works so when you're developing these uh, prototypes what you're trying to do is to get the users and the developers to understand each other as far as the requirements are concerned so the developer is trying to show the user whether they have managed to capture the requirements correctly by coming up with a simple uh, or small system that tries to demonstrate the understanding of the requirements from the perspective of the user I mean of, from the perspective of the developer so you find that there are a number of uh, there are just a few types of prototypes we have got an evolutionary prototype so an ev evolutionary prototype is actually a pro prototype where you are developing the system and you continue improving that prototype until it fully turns into the system that you want it to be so with evolutionary prototypes it's like you have already started the development but you have started with a very small part just to show the user what they want and then you start adding more functionality to that prototype until it becomes a fully fledged system and then there are also a requirements prototype where all you're trying to do is to sh to get the um, an understanding between the user and the developer to show that whether the uh, requirements have been understood rightly or wrongly and then to allow for communication to to happen so that you eventually have um, all the right requirements in place so what are some of the key things that we get from from prototyping so you find that with prototyping it allows for a lot of uh, constructive feedback during development if you're doing your evolutionary prototyping it also it can it can be produced in a very short time it can actually be produced in days not just weeks you know and then users are actually more happy because it quickly translates the requirements into a system and it allows them to be comfortable to know that the, the, the developers understand what is required it also allows for early detection of errors um, if the developer develops something that's not right either from a requirements perspective or from a technical perspective it can quickly be seen and it can be sorted before it actually becomes either a catastrophic or an expensive mistake however some of the uh, disadvantages of um, of uh, prototyping is that it makes it difficult to reject and re and start over when you have already developed the prototype to a great extent so as you develop your prototype and improve it using the evolutionary prototyping method it makes it a bit difficult now to say after having gone through many iterations and improvements and as well as feature addition to the prototype to say this one is not good because now it becomes costly in terms of time and money and you're not sure whether you still have the resources in terms of human resources to be able to develop the system further it also there is no formal end of phase reviews so the system is just being developed just like code and fix sort of 
you are not really reviewing whether you have actually met a certain requirement as you go ahead with um, this prototype. There's also lack of documentation which makes it difficult for other people to maintain the system or to continue developing the system. Then there are issues also that can arise from system backup and recovery and performance because these things can be overlooked while everybody is focused on um, the functionality of the system. So as you do your rapid application development, you'll find that you do a lot of prototyping, you come up with a lot of prototypes, and as you, as you combine joint application development and prototyping, you can actually come up with a very robust rapid application development methodology that allows you to develop your systems very fast and in a way that actually satisfies the, uh, the requirements. Although it also has its own caveats or disadvantages where you can actually have no documentation or poor documentation, poor review stages, um, overlooking of certain key things like how are you going to recover the system if in the event of a, a failure, how are you going to deploy it, how are you going to back it up, etc. So those are all the issues that you need to, to, to be thinking about as you look at um, prototyping, joint application development, as well as general rapid application development. Now let's move to the last uh, software development methodology that you want to look at, the spiral model. So before we, we, we do anything, <coughs> I just want you to understand something here. Because the spiral model at times, it can be difficult for a lot of people to understand. The spiral model is basically a combination of the waterfall model and the agile method, uh, methodologies. So we can say it's both a waterfall and an agile methodology in the sense that with the spiral method, as you can see in this diagram, you are actually following a spiral, right? It's actually forming a spiral. But how do you form the spiral? Number one, what you do is in the first iteration or in the first step, you use a waterfall model. So in the first, for example, if we start here, start, right? We will go through the determine, determining objectives, evaluating alternatives, uh, develop and verify next products, or and then you get into plan next phase. We will do this up to this stage without going backwards. So under each uh, spiral, you are using the waterfall method. And then you repeat those four key main steps using an agile methodology. So what is what, what the spiral method is doing is allowing you to say, as you go through all the steps, you can go through them without going back, right? So it, it allows for thoroughness as well as for speed of development. But once you are done with all the steps, it allows you now to then go over those steps again until you, you come up with a system that you're happy with. So in each spiral, one spiral allows you to, you go through one spiral using the waterfall method, and then you go over those steps again on another, uh, on another spiral, and you go through them again on another spiral. So you are basically having many iterations over the same steps, but as you go through all those iterations, you are now, um, you are basically doing an, an iterative approach because you are repeating steps, but you repeat them only after you have completed all the steps in, a, in, a, in order. So let's just look at the waterfall model again so that we can emphasize that point. So this is our waterfall model. Now, if we are going to use the spiral model, what we do is we go through the user requirements, the software requirements, architecture, de detailed design, testing, and delivery using the waterfall model, okay? So we go through this in the first in the first spiral, going through these steps without going back to the other one. But the moment we get to maybe delivery, we then loop back, okay? And we start again with the user requirements. And then we go through these iterations without going back to the next step. So if you are now at architecture design in the second iteration, you don't go back to software requirements. No, you finish all of them. Then you can only come back again at the third spiral. And then you go through these steps again using the waterfall model. Then you look, up, you look back again. So you can find that what we have done here is we have combined uh, the waterfall model as well as the iterative nature. So it's allowing us to first go through the waterfall model, then to restart the waterfall model again. And we can do that multiple times. And each uh, time is what constitutes a spiral. Let me just get the diagram on again for a spiral. Okay, so this is our spiral. 
um, so you find that here it's p1 so p1 is basically saying that's our our first spiral in our first spiral we go through all these stages okay we go through let's just call them uh, for simplicity's sake we can say we go through our analysis our planning our analysis our design and our implementation then in the second spiral we then go through those steps again but remember in each spiral you don't go back to the next to the last step you are following the waterfall model in each spiral so each spiral is representing a waterfall model that you're following and the the total number of spirals is show is now showing you the iterative nature of the spiral methodology so please just remember in your head uh, the spiral method methodology combines uh, agile methodology in the form of iterations as well as the waterfall model in the sense that once you're going you go through uh, the waterfall model you can only go back to a stage after you've finished all the other stages and then you are now looping back to the first stage so in this video we've basically looked at um, software development methodologies and these software development methodologies are guided by the overall software development life cycle and we said software development methodologies are basically the steps that are taken during the development of a software. And all these steps fall under the software development life cycle. So this is the expanded version of the software development life cycle. And we looked at the code and fix methodology. We looked at the commercial of the shelf customization methodology. Then we looked at the waterfall model. Then we looked at the agile methodologies, in particular the rapid application development methodology, the joint application development methodology, as well as prototyping. Then we also looked at the spiral um, development methodology. Now the spiral methodology is really key when it comes to issues to do with um, risk management. Because since it allows you to, to go through the waterfall, which allows you to really make sure that you're doing the right thing, which is the advantage of the waterfall model, the iterative nature now allows you to fix mistakes that might have been made in the other st in the previous steps and allow you to actually develop the system and make it better and better unlike the pure waterfall model and unlike the pure uh, agile methodologies so the spiral model is combining the two and allowing them to actually form um, a, com a combination of methodologies into into one so I hope you have understood all the things in this video and you can ask questions where you did not understand. Thank you.